right, hello, and welcome to the next panel here at SCG Con Summer 2019. My name is Jeremy Knoll. This panel is going to be Commander Rules Committee. Uh, so today we have with us two members of the Commander Rules Committee, and I will allow them to introduce themselves. Sheldon. Uh, hi, my name is Sheldon Mennery. Uh, I'm the, one of the founding members of the Commander's Rule, Commander Rules Committee and the creator of the Commander format. All right, and Scott? And I'm Scott Larrabee. I work in the eSports department at Wizards of the Coast, and I'm the only, only Wizards employee on the Rules Committee. And, right. and certainly we're here also representing uh, Toby Elliott and Gavin Duggan, our other two members who couldn't be here this weekend but would love to. All right, so for this panel, we basically asked people to send in questions, uh, and this was proposed by Sheldon as a just have people ask us whatever they want. Just no holds barred. Let's let's do this. And if you have questions in the audience, uh, we do have some index cards up here. You can go ahead and write your questions down, hand them to our director, Dan, over here, and he will take those, and we'll try and get to those. Um, so let's kind of go over some of the basics. Uh, the first thing is that what does the rules committee actually do? Nothing. Yeah, very little. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we, we spend time making sure the commander is a good format all the time. Um, we, we make sure that we meet quarterly, but the, one of the big things is that the, all four of us have been pretty close friends for a long, long time. So it's not like we go three months without speaking to each other. Uh, you know, we, we certainly have weekly, daily conversations and most of them will then end up will be Devolving talking about the into commander. Yeah. So we, you know, so we manage the format's philosophy. We sculpt the ban list and the, the reasons why we ban and don't ban cards. And then, of course, I think our our third function really is to promote the greatest format in Magic history. All right. And then recently, it was announced uh, within the last few months that you have decided to kind of in a way, expand the way that the Rules Committee works by creating the Commander Advisory Group, which is a selection of members of the community that have uh, their various members, their podcasts, gameplay videos, things of that nature. Uh, what, what spurned you to actually start that up? The, um, I, th I think the, the big thing was what we wanted to expand our outreach. Um, I, one of the criticisms that we'd frequently gotten was that, that we're, we were sort of ivory tower-like, and there was a lot of distance and, and not communication. So the, the CAG was in, was in part an effort to broaden the, the horizons of the, of the RC, that, that we would get more people who are more connected, and you'll notice that all the CAG members are people who have a very broad reach and you know it was intentionally done that way so that we can we could just hear more you know so funneling the entirety of the immense commander community through 10 voices is better than through six right and the decision was made to do an advisory group rather than expand the committee just because it's hard enough to get the four of us together and talk yeah. about decision making without having 10. it's really funny too i mean you say you know people looked at us as an ivory tower and that and somehow we were all thinking the same thing all the time, right. yeah. which is not true at all. <laughs> <laughs> we argue over a lot of things. There's definitely a range of opinions about any given commander issue on the committee. Um, but it's usually majority rules and it's fine. So it's not just four people there, sitting there going, so, we hate fun. Right, right, right. right, right. We hate fun. Yeah. But uh, expand, expanding it to the advisory group so far has been really good. Yeah. Um, what we figured out in the in the very short term after the first meeting we have is that yeah pretty much we're all on board generally with this. Yeah. when we were discussing about rewriting the philosophy uh we just i, I thought i was going to hear a lot more dissension about a few things we really didn't things really didn't get hopping until we started talking about banning cards and yeah whether things should be banned or unbanned and then there was oh suddenly opinions diverged <laughs> wildly so. and then uh kind of speaking of that how do you determine what actually ends up either on or coming off of the ban list. It's well, been so long since we've done one. It's, yeah. <laughs> well, it's hard. <laughs> in, in theory, we, we actually do it every quarter. Yes. It's just that we don't make a change. So what will happen briefly is there will be a lot of discussion. 
And then at a certain point when we had enough discussion, like, okay, do we need to vote on anything? Uh, you know, we don't go in just voting all the time. It's, you know, do we, do we have enough of a divergence of opinion that we actually need to vote on it? And then we have an internal process on how we vote on things, on how the four of us um, vote on things. And there, there have to be thresholds met. Um, and again, the way we do it is we assign values to how strongly we feel about an issue on a, on a plus two to minus two scale. And the reason it works is, again, we've worked together. I mean, Scott and I have worked together for 20, 20 years. years on professional magic. Um, so we, we know and trust each other that nobody's going to try to game the system. You know, if, if I say plus one on something, they know that I mean plus one, not that I'm worried about the, some other, somebody else's plus one. You're not trying to politic the, right. the, the band right. list yeah. or the, the And rules. the range, that, that plus and minus range allows you to do things like, if you just literally don't care, you can just vote zero. Right. Yeah. I am true neutral on this. I could care less. Right. That's fair. So then yeah, if a threshold met is when uh, a card gets banned or unbanned, um, the, burden, the burden is really hard for a card to get unbanned. It's, it's one of those things that, you know, we're really conservative about when we choose to ban something. Um, Grizzle Brand was certainly the fastest card to ever get banned. Maybe. You know, Prophet Crufix was alive in the wild for a year or so. Mm -hmm. This one comes from Jeremy Knoll. Why do you hate Prophet Crufix? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, the, the, the interesting one is Primeval Titan, mm -hmm. is that when we started that meeting, we didn't even have it on the agenda. And somebody mentioned, I think, in context of a different card, Primeval Titan. And we started talking about Primeval Titan, and a half hour later, we'd voted to ban it. Yeah, we were all like, <laughs> oh, weird. my God. Like, yeah, <laughs> I didn't, you know. Each of us didn't realize how strongly the other three felt, um, just like we did. Right, and that's why those discussions are important. And that's, and yeah, that's why the discussions are important. But, you know, if you... If you don't really, you know, if you were in violent agreement on something, then there's no reason to vote on it. Yeah. Right. Just continue on to the next issue. But I think with Primeval Titan, everybody thought that they were the only one that thought that. Yeah. So nobody brings it up. And so it was a good lesson learned is yeah. that, you know, if you have thoughts about a card, have thoughts about it. I do that sure. occasionally. I'll just kind of email everybody and go, hey, and what do you think? And somebody goes, ah, no problem. You misread the card, Laramie. Yeah. So. <laughs> and one of the things we do as a as a thought exercise, every time, every meeting, we have a discussion on unbanning a card. Like, just whose turn is it to pick a card? And then let's talk about it. Let's talk about mm -hmm. it. You know, and, and we that way we make sure that our reasons for banning the card are still relevant, and that we can and then we can argue for them. You know, well, balance seems like it could be okay. And, and then, like, you know, three people go, okay, here are the reasons. <laughs> Mox Ruby is fine. Yeah. Yeah, but Ruby. then we would have to unbound on the other four. Right. Mox Ruby's fine. Nobody plays red anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, kind of, one of the other aspects, well, obviously, ban, ban list is one of the big ones that is uh, pretty public facing that a lot of people know. Uh, the other one is actually just the, in general, the rules of Commander. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing that the R Rules Committee actually determines. And uh, so what thoughts go into changing the rules? Uh, and obviously, like, one of the big examples is this just actually happened. The, uh, the, the Wizards of the Coast announced that they are going to actually be moving to the London Mulligan after mm -hmm. testing it out mm -hmm. and for all constructed formats. And the Rules Committee posted this will actually be happening as well with Commander. So what kind of thoughts go into changing the rules when those happen? Changing a rule, again, all, changing something always bears a really high burden of proof that you want to make sure if you're making a change, you're making it for the right reasons and, a, and good reasons. Um, we talked about the London Mulligan as soon as we knew about it. Yeah. And uh, we started discussing what the danger points might be. Uh, okay, what, what would make the London Mulligan, you know, if after all of Wizards of the Coast testing, uh, they decide to adopt it, what would be the danger points for us? And it didn't seem any more um, tilted toward, considerably tilted toward any uh, archetype or style. Uh, you know, it certainly isn't any more, as far as I'm concerned, it's not 
significantly more combo friendly, for example, than any other mulligans that we've used yeah. before. So it seems safe. It seemed like like there there are no glaring problems with it. That's a you know that was the first thing, and then since there were no problems with it, consistency across all formats of Magic seemed like a really good idea. Yeah, I mean Mulligan rule changes in Commander are always a bit specious anyway, just because so many groups do their own thing. So yeah. yes, there's an official Mulligan rule, but I've rarely played in games where yeah, those yeah, are I, followed. I, I pretty much anytime somebody goes to like. Five. I'm just, like, just get a seven. keepable seven. The just least followed commander rule yeah, is, the exactly. rule. Is, yeah. is the Mulligan rule, I believe. So, I mean, honestly, when when the, the the rules committee plays together, we draw seven. If you can't play it, set it aside. Draw seven more. Can't play it, ship it. You know. But again, we trust each other. We know each other. Nobody's going to abuse this, or nobody's going to nobody's going to short the land counts in their deck to thirty so that they can you know draw just, just gas. Like that, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so it, outside of things like mulligan rules, which are, again, as you said, probably the least followed rule in Commander itself, uh, what, what kind of thought goes into like the current rules as they are and deciding whether or not you want to change them? So something like, do we really need 40 life? Uh, is Infect really okay at 10, 10 Infect counters? Uh, you know, things of that nature. The rules that are already set, that are that kind of still make Commander its own format. Changing the life total rule would be difficult at this point because cards are now designed around it. Yeah. yeah. So changing that would be more difficult than it would be when we first... I mean, I know a lot of people know that when I first started playing Commander, when Sheldon first showed it to me, the starting life total rule was it's 200 points divided by the number of people in the game. So it was just this weird thing. One of the reasons we changed it was that it was, it was kind of like, eh, why should we have to do this calculation? Who needs 40, math? 40 <laughs> seems great. <laughs> Math so is for block. We, we went to <laughs> for so blocker. something like the uh, the life total rule that would be something a little more difficult to do. Now poison is a whole nother thing. Where yes, yeah. we could do it, but um, Toby Toby Elliot would be the one who'd be jumping in here and going, <laughs> ten's fine. Move on." Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, are, yes, blight steel well, colossus exists. To, to kind of go <laughs> along with this, what what are some of the most debated rules changed between the RC? Oh wow, we had a pretty significant debate on changing the mana color generation rules. Yeah, that's you know, true. it used okay. to be you couldn't generate mana outside of your commander's color identity. Yeah. And um, like I was, Birds of Paradise or anything yeah, like that would only mm -hmm. only oh, get, yeah. grant you whatever. Right. You right. right. Yeah. Um, and I was the last, I was kind of the last holdout on this. I think Gavin was the one that started the ball rolling. He often does. Probably about, yeah. I don't know, 2012 or something. Right. And um, the, the internal discussion was, well, you know, this is this is sort of foundational and, uh, you know, I don't want a commander to lose its identity. And uh, eventually it came around to, uh, again, like long periods of, of chatting about it, that it didn't it didn't affect so many cards. Like his first argument was, well, it never comes up in a game. Right. And I'm, of course it doesn't come in a game. It can't. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's like, you know, pay attention to the games, and if, even if somebody has um, dark stealing it, how often would they actually use it to... And it's, it, it seems like it, would, it opened up a few possibilities without really um, promoting a certain deck style. You know, blue, blue is basically the only color that generally wants to generate mana outside of its, mm -hmm. its color identity. Yeah. And it, 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 I realized... Well, I think what brought me around, I, that the other guys came to it a, a long, longer, uh, earlier than I did, mm -hmm. was that it was such a corner case, and you don't make rules for your corner cases, you make rules for your common cases. The thing that I was, from the beginning, on board with the how foundational it was to the format, meaning that you have this commander and everything in your deck is about this commander, and if you have a red-white commander, it just doesn't even understand what blue mana is. It's this right. weird thing, so they can't use it. The thing that really got me to change it was somebody in Magic r and I don't remember who, we were having this discussion, and what they pointed out to me is that it's kind of one of those gotcha rules. When yeah. you're a new player, and you suddenly have somebody else's thing, and you see the activation, and you're like, wow, now I can use the activation, and somebody goes, oh no, you can't do that. It's like this gotcha rule, because it's you know, buried down in yeah. color identity rules. And I was like, okay, that's what finally got me. I'm like, ah, yeah. okay, that's fair. You know, you're trying to grow a format. Why put, you know, barrier gotcha rules in play? Yeah, yeah. 
That's fair. Um, so I've had it, no, I've had people try to tell me that the commander rule is a gotcha rule, you know, commander <laughs> like, you know, and I'm like, no, it isn't. It's no, right there no, up front. Yeah. This is how you win. That's format defined. Right. Written on the tin, yeah. 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 Uh, so kind of in the same vein of, of the the mana change to the, the rules there, we do have a question from uh, one of our submissions here, Samuel Steinbach Pratt, who actually brought up, would the rules committee ever consider revisiting how hybrid mana works in the game or is treated in the game? And this is something else that has been brought up quite a bit where you can't actually use It has a been brought up many times. Yes. Uh, I, I'm sure I answer this question twice a month at least. Yeah. Um, so I understand how hybrid mana was designed to be. What I, I we're, we're all familiar with what um, Mark Rosewater was thinking of when hybrid mana happened. You know, here's a card that you can play in a mono black deck, you can play in a mono red deck. Great, that's fine. I, the, the, reason, the reason that it was created is fine. The problem for me, and the main, the main sticking point is, those cards are still both color identity. A Kulrath Knight is both a black and a red card. So let's assume, let's assume Scott was playing um, a mono black deck. Let's say, uh, you know, we allowed hybrid mana to be the way that, um, you know, you could use it in a mono color deck. Scott plays Kulrath Knight in his mono black deck and he casts Kulrath Knight. And I go, red elemental, or yeah, a blue elemental blast. He's like, well, you can't. I played back black mana for it. Well, that's not the way it works. It's still a black card and it's still a red card. So as long as color identity means something, Hybrid, hybrid cards will still be both colors. If, if red elemental blast or blue elemental blast or anything that affects a color will affect a card, then hybrid will stay as, and, and the rules committee, like, we're like strongly committed to the direction we're on. Yeah, I'm committed for a diff slightly different reason, but in, in that I just believe it would make, lead to more homogenation of decks. Like one of the great things about this format is the restrictions it places on you where you can only use these colors, you can only have one, et cetera, et cetera. And this would just make that a little bit easier to make decks stronger. Like, oops, right. you know. So still no beseech the queen in my colorless deck. My Correct. Deck zero no. Deck. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next one comes from Michael Woodyard. <clears throat> Pardon me, Mark, Michael Woodyard, who says, uh, and this is something that uh, I believe that they were not aware of, that this has already been a thing in the past. Uh, do you think it might be better to have two ban lists, one for competitive play and one for casual play, maybe, maybe adding a suggestion list of cards to look out for, like when the committee allowed silver bordered cards? And if you know your history of the commander format, there were actually two ban lists at one point, one that was a general, you cannot play this card at all, and one that was a banned as commander list that was specifically, you could still play this, play this in your 99, but you would not be able to play this as uh, your commander specifically. Right. So... Uh, I believe that those that question and the reason why you changed from that are probably going to be similar. But uh, do you want to discuss that a little bit? Yeah the the real the real thing is like I said earlier you make you make your rule set for the common cases, not the corner cases. And band as a commander was a rule that we had for four cards, and four is not a significant percentage of magic cards, so. You know, having a rule for Rafelos, Arayo, and Braids, Braids and uh, what's this word? Emrakul. Em Emrakul. Emrakul. Yeah, Emrakul was later, but yeah. It, it just yeah. didn't. It didn't make sense. And not ha not having split lists is good for messaging purposes. You know, there are a lot of people who play Commander. You people are committed and trenched, invested Commander players, right? You're going to look at the rules you know, all the time, you're gonna think about the rules. There are a lot of casual commander players too, and we wanna make sure that what we have to say makes sense to them as well. And, you know, separate list here, separate list here, separate list here, gets kind of crazy. And um, simplicity is, is important. And I think the sort of simplicity approach is the reason that the, one of the reasons that the explosion in popularity of commander has happened. It's, it's, it's relatively easy to grasp. Particularly when we made some early changes yes. to the rules. <laughs> yes. In the late aughts. Yeah. 
we were, I mean, we were just telling Jeremy before we started, there used to be something called the Ruffellos Rule, and it was around 2005 or so. So this was actually before we formally formed the, the Rules Committee. And it was just me and Gavin and uh, another Canadian judge named Duncan McGregor. And if your commander costs less than six, you paid six for it. So to, so to cast Ruffellos, you would, you would cast it for six, for six, for six, and then for eight. Um, and again, we were like, why are we making rules for just one card? We'll ban the guy, <laughs> we'll ban the damn thing, and, and move on. All right. So kind of in the same vein, do you feel like uh, that there would be any sort of suggestions or like, like they said, a suggested list of cards to look out for when considering things like competitive play versus casual play? I think that the, the competitive play thing is something that's coming up a lot more where people are like, you need to ban lists. And <clears throat> my reaction to people like that has been, somebody out there should pick up and do a competitive ban list. But it's not, it's just not what we're about. Yeah, mm -hmm. there have been other, yeah. other groups that have decided that they wanted to do their own thing based on the right. commander format. There was like French, the French and, yep. and, and things of that nature where, where they did just go ahead and make their own list right. or their own rules. And we were fine with that. Mm -hmm. We didn't really interact with those guys very much, but we would steer people towards them. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, say, Kevin, De Kevin Dupre was, was on the Commander Rules Committee for a little while. And I mean, he's a, Kevin is a very smart magic mind. And, you know, it, the, I think one of the reasons, I, you know, I, we hear this, well, why don't you, why don't you have a separate um, competitive list? And then we say, well, if somebody wants to do it, do it. There are competing factions, apparently, in the CEDH community, and they don't want the other to have to, any to win out. To, to win out. Um, I feel like it, this is very similar to uh, the idea of you're going to show up to play a game of Commander, and everyone should kind of agree because it's a social aspect of the game, and that's like a pretty big inherent thing with the game, with the format itself. But it would be the same as if you were trying to make a house rule at your local game store of, okay, well, here's this list of banned cards for your FNM because we don't want people to play the tier decks. Right. right. But if you go to a different LGS, you're just going to have a completely different experience. So That's certainly part of it. I've, I've had discussions with people who are very competitive, and they've said, you know, we'd really like you guys to... What The request we got was, we'd like you to adjust your ban list to cover command. We're not saying that you should change your list. We just want you to add cards to it so that it makes the competitive more fair. And I said, I think we would just prefer that somebody else go off and make their and own competitive format. List, their own version. And they're like, no, we don't want to split the audience. It's like, right. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> I don't think we can do both things at once. And, like, we just... and quite honestly, the bona fides of the people, some of the people on the rules committee for making rule sets like Scott and like Toby um, is significant. You know, if you don't know, Toby has had a hand in writing um, professional magic policy for... Since I've been doing it. So Toby, Toby Elliott and I also write the tournament rules for, for all competitive play for magic. I, you know, I, I do it as part of my job. Toby's contracted to help as a subject matter expert. And yeah. so we know a little bit about rules. I, yeah, I, I flatter myself that I know a thing or two about competitive magic. <laughs> All right, so we got another one from Tyler Owens, who says, if you could change one of the rules, Commander, what would it be and why? It could be removing an existing rule, adding a new one. Well, we can. <laughs> <laughs> they said magically, and I thought, well, that you just can do that, so. Um, I would let, I would make a rule to ban griefers. <laughs> uh. Like if I had, it was like somebody said, okay, if, um, if Bill Gates said the Gate Foundation will give $100 million to great charity if you change one commander rule, I'd pick some low-hanging low fruit, like, I, like I'd make Infect 15. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess I'd make Infect 15. 15. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, do you have any? I don't. I, I, guess, I guess a I better know. way to kind of raise the question I, I, is I think is is there one rule in particular that you have been had opinions on that the other three have been kind of on the opposite end of uh yes mostly they come down to individual cards yeah where, individual cards. 
not rules. The rest yeah. of the committee will want will be talking about unbanning a card, and I'm like, I think you guys are nuts to unban <laughs> that particular card. Yeah. But yeah, rules wise, we're I, we're pretty much in lockstep on everything. Again, the the colored mana generation was kind of the last holdout, and mm -hmm. I can't. I, I'm just. I was trying to dream up what we would argue about, yeah. and I don't think that, you know, like there's there's really nothing. I think. Yeah, know, I think the answer to the question is, you know, what, what one rule would you want to change? I think if there's one I wanted to change, we'd have done it already. Yeah. So, yeah. If, yeah. If it, I don't if have an was, answer to that. If it was important and we thought it was good for the community, we would have yeah. done it already. All right. Uh, so, this one asks specifically about unbanning cards, but I kind of want to, as as like more of an idea of what the thought process is for, uh, as you said, somebody brings up one card to bring off, off mm -hmm. of the ban list, uh, what kind of discussions would you have about certain cards? So they specifically ask about Biorhythm and Painter Servant. Mm -hmm. So let's go with Biorhythm and kind of give an example of how that would be brought up in this discussion and somebody kind of advocating for it and how you would, how you would go about that. How would you advocate for biorhythm to come up? Well, I, I think the first point, the first point that I'd make if I was try, if I was the advocate was like it cost eight. Now, the problem is it cost eight in green, which which is like costing two. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Might as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, one of the things we're working on right now is updating the Commander of Philosophy document. Uh, we wrote the philosophy document in 2011 or early 2012, and it's served us relatively well, and we don't want to change the underlying idea of the commander philosophy, just sort of want to bring it into the 21st century. Um, we want to modernize it because the, the player base of commander in 2011 and the player base of commander in 2019 are radically, radically different. Um, so we want to make sure, again, that we're talking to the the sort of core demographic of the commander audience um, instead of the fringes. And uh, the, the CAG is giving us a, a great deal of help on this. Um, by M20, we'll probably have something new. And then everything, everything flows from philosophy. You, you develop philosophy first in an organization, and then you develop the rules to fit the philosophies. So, okay, our philosophy is, you know, we want, you know, memorable, fun games of Commander. So now, how do we how do we make that happen? But you can't, I think you can't do it without having the underlying philosophy. And you know, one of those things is, for example, we want to encourage an environment where we recognize that all play styles are valid, but we don't necessarily give equal weight to all play styles, right? We, you know, we think that giving, making sure that everybody has the opportunity to play the game is really, really important to Commander. Um, so the philosophy document will, re will reflect things like that. And, uh, you know, you'll see, you'll see in my upcoming uh, work on Star City Games, uh, we'll, to we'll talk about this a good deal. And we've, we've said this a lot, that the ban list doesn't represent the be all and end all of the philosophy document, but mostly represents the outliers. Yeah the most egregious offenders, and then we allow the social contract that exists between people at the table or people at their local yeah. store to decide for them whether they want to do something above yeah. and beyond that. If you have a regular group that you play with all the time, it is more than welcome for you to just say, hey, yeah. we are going to, no one is allowed to play Cyclonic Rift or yeah, Soul I mean, Ring or whichever card that you feel is reflection. Agrarian. Yeah, wound reflection. People, right. I mean, wound reflection isn't banned, but somebody's playing wound reflection, yeah. So that nobody, you know, so that the game ends in you know eight turns, then yeah. You know, my my usual stance is take that out of your deck, or I won't. I don't want to play with that against yeah. you anymore. I know that that for, deck. I know what it's for. Like various different uh, groups that you might watch uh, do commander gameplay, like Commander versus uh, MTG Goldfish's Commander Clash, Game Nights, things of that nature. We have our own various lists of like soft bands where we may not always follow it, but for the most part, we try and avoid cards. I know that for us, we try and avoid things like Cyclonic Rift because it does, entertainment wise, watching the show, we, yeah. it does slow the game down. So it just kind of creates this lull where everybody has to build back up. I know for Commander Clash, they try and say things like Soul Ring, Mana Crypt, and then like any card over $100 when people submit oh. that list. They don't, oh. they don't want to mess with that because yeah. they don't. 
So sure. your own individual group can also just determine what they want. The language, the language on the ban list, which um, Gavin and I have sort of been fighting about since we formed the rules committee in 2006, was these cards are banned, and you and you shouldn't and you should consider not playing other cards like them. So philosophically, we kind of want the ban list. It, there's obviously a hard ban. You know, you need, especially in untrusted environments, you know, here where you don't know the people you're playing with, there's a hard ban list. Uh, but these should also serve as as ideas for your own group to think about the kind of cards that maybe you shouldn't be playing with because they're because they're antisocial, and we obviously want to be the social format. I mean, Wound, Re Wound Reflection for me is a good example of a card that I used to play with. And I played with it, and after about, I don't know, about a month, five or six games, I realized, you know what, nobody's having fun when I put this out. Right. So I take it out of the deck. And my deck is, it's just as good. Yeah. It's, All right, you know. So so Soren Markov, Wound Reflection, ha ha ha. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this one is kind of in a, a uh, similar vein to what you were just discussing. Um, so this one comes from David Thompson, who asks, uh, this is more rules adjacent, but in keeping with your respective philosophies of what makes the best type of gameplay experience for a commander game, what's your thought process on like for selecting decks to bring to events like SCGCon? If you're coming into a, a new event where you might not have ever played with these people before and you have a limited amount of space, I can only bring five decks, three decks, 10 decks, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. how, how do you determine which I'll ones take you want one to first. actually bring? For me, it's easy because I only have five decks at any given time. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have 15, I don't have what, 40? 40, 47. 47 yeah. decks that Sheldon has. I, I have five and you know maybe once a year I'll rotate one out and get a new one going. The, the thing for me is I don't have time to update them every time a new set comes out. So five's about my limit. So five is also very portable, so I can just bring all my decks yeah, every time I come. Um, for for me, the answer is bringing a is always bringing um, a grouping of decks from the sort of ones that play the hardest to the ones that play the easiest, and that way, you know, I can talk to the people when we sit down, and really, rule zero is important. Talk to the people you're playing with, and uh, that way we can have a good we have a good game. I mean, we want to have a good game. Again, we want to we want to create the games that you're going to remember, not the ones you want to forget. And uh, if somebody's playing a hundred percent solution deck, and everybody else is playing, you know, barely modified precons, it's probably not going to be a fun game. So, you know, I bring I bring decks that that um, go across the spectrum so that we can all that we can have a good game. And I'll generally ask, it's like, uh, you know, I haven't played this deck this weekend, and here's kind of how it is. Um, you know, anybody have any objections? And we go from there. Yeah, for me, so. I just play I, I, the decks I like to play. Sheldon and I were talking the other day about a, a scale of rating decks from one to five, where you know, five is the... What would Category five was like the CDH decks. Category four is the 100% solution decks. Like, not the competitive decks, but 100% tuned, like really savage. Uh, right. Three Category is, three is the seventy-five percent solution, where ninety percent of all decks are in three. Yeah, the, then, most I think most of what we're all playing are in the are in the category three range, where one is a precon or a barely a yeah. barely modified precon. And I thought about my decks and I went, I think I have four threes and maybe a three and a half. Right. <laughs> my I skeleton think, uh, ship deck may. There, may there are also various uh, to various scales that you can go off of. Sure. Because I know that we've we've done that several times where we've gone through a uh, like what percentage uh, on a scale of one to ten. One of the other ones that we've uh, at Commander Versus have done on occasion is uh, what level of competitive event would you take this deck to? Is this a is this a Friday night magic or a you know is this a um, like a, a, a standard showdown or equivalent right. you know, or is this a pro tour deck? Right. Like, if you were to play this as competitive magic, and you were just like, I want to try my Jink Brew at our regular Saturday event, this that's going to be your, your one. Yeah. Or is it going to be like, because we don't generally play in the, like, just barely modified pre-cons mm -hmm. on our show. Sure. So we kind of go on that scale of, like, I'm having fun with this theme, and then move up to, right. here's, here is the CEDH 
you yeah. know, Thrasios Timna deck that we're going to play. Yeah, if I yeah. were going to a competitive event, I'd build a new deck. Yeah, me yeah. too. Me too. Exactly. I, and I would just, I would really hate for somebody to show up, like, for their first SCG con and, you know, get their command zone badge and come in and, you know, again, they've got their barely modified pre-con. They, you know, they've taken all the come to play tap lands. <laughs> they've built out. their Arabo cat deck. Right. Or... And, and just, get, you know, get curb stomped by... Flash Hulk. Yeah. Something. And so I think you, 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 again, rule zero is just so important to the underlying um, ethos of the format. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I think we're going to end it there. Wow. We're done already? A little early, but it's still, we talked about Commander for 40-ish minutes, so... Yeah, well, uh, we, could, we could talk about Commander all day. We could, and we will, uh, if you join us over in the Command at the Zone. Tables. All three yes, of us at the tables. Yes, at the tables. And we will be playing. I will be there a little bit later this afternoon. I know you two will be pretty, there pretty much the entire rest of the weekend. Yep. Uh, and, yeah, if you have any individual questions, just come over and talk to us while we're playing. For we'll be sure. happy to answer them. We do have a couple more things going on today. We have the MTG Paint Night, which starts at 6 o'clock with Ken Meyer Jr., who they are going to be painting... A reproduction of Kurt Ape, and his version of it will be auctioned off on eBay for 100% uh, of the proceeds going to Angels of Assisi. We also have team trivia occurring in the Coliseum at 6 p.m. If you'd like to check that out, uh, there's actually some really good, really good options there. And uh, yeah, and you can join us again tomorrow starting at 12:30 for more panels. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your SCG con. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>